All right, my name is Jack Wampler, and I am a graduate student at the University of Colorado Boulder under Professor Eric Wustro, and I represent the Refraction Networking team, and today I'm here to talk with you all about the Refraction Networking system and our deployment of Refraction Networking tools. So the first question I want to try and answer is, uh, what is Refraction Networking, um, and what is in what ways, as a proxy, is refraction sort of non-traditional and breaking some of the paradigms of uh, proxying and virtual private networks? Um, and I want to talk through the design of the refraction network stations and some of the refraction networking protocol uh, to try and give you an idea of the way that the system all works. Uh, from there, I want to talk a little bit about the way that we leverage PFRing given our sort of unique networking requirements to make the refraction networking system work. Um, sort of walk through a little bit of that. And then finally talk a bit about our deployment and some of the impact that we've seen over the last year. So with that, let's get started. So refraction networking, as I said, is a non-traditional proxy. And what that means is that uh, we function in sort of a different way than typical proxy. So a proxy that you've used before probably works with a server and a client and the client connects to the server, and the server forwards the traffic on the client's behalf. Uh, and in most proxies, the server is just an endpoint on the internet that you connect to. Refraction networking uh, takes a similar model and just moves the proxying logic into the middle of the network to a partner or participating internet service provider router. Some sort of infrastructural uh, deployment helps us to prevent uh, blocking by making it sort of difficult to identify the, pr the protocols to begin with and also difficult to block a large address space that could potentially par be participating in this uh, system. So in order to get connected, a user uh, uses uh, our client software on their computer to request a blocked site uh, and the client software tunnels uh, that request within a connection to a reachable site. Uh, one that a sensor would you know, not look twice at, not blink at, and the sensor's firewall will allow this request to pass through. Um, so on the path between the client and that reachable site, one of our participating internet service provider locations refracts the request out of uh, the tunnel and passes it to the blocked site, giving the user access to the content that they were interested in accessing. So to go over that, the protocol in a little bit more detail, um, and this is the specifically the tap dance protocol, uh, the way it works is the client opens a TLS connection to what we call a decoy site. And this is going to be a site that's unblocked within the country. Um, client is able to open a connection and talk with the site normally. Our station, our refraction deployment is deployed, or our, our refraction station is deployed at a router somewhere on the path between the client and that decoy site, and the refraction station receives a copy of all the traffic going through that router. The refraction station watches for uh, participating connections by uh, checking connections for a steganographic tag, and then for flows that do include that uh, secret hidden tag, uh, it prevents the decoy site from providing a real response and then proxies traffic on the client's behalf, uh, going to the, the block sites that they, they're trying to access, giving them the content they, they're trying to uh, view, and embedding the responses uh, in the existing TLS connection. Our refraction station sort of takes over that TLS connection and spoofs responses from that site on the client's behalf, only for participating connections. So in order to do this, our stations have a pretty specialized design. And uh, that starts with uh, high speed uh, taps where we ingest packets and we have a multi-threaded application that checks for tags and tracks uh, flow parameters so that we know when we have identified participating, flow, participating flows with full confidence. Um, and so those are called the detectors. And once the detectors identify a participating connection, they pass it to the proxy 
which can do session management and uh, uh, response uh, uh, spoofing and accessing that content on the client's behalf. But these taps require pretty high speed packet processing as the interfaces, the individual interfaces that we're reading from are typically you know, 10 to 40 or more gigabit per second taps. Uh, and just to give you an idea, this is a, a subset, a plot of the, the traffic seen at a subset of our stations. Um, I believe this is three or four uh, uh, taps. And you can see that on a daily basis over the, the last week as of recording this, they fluctuate from anywhere from around five gigabits per second up to and above 35 gigabits per second. So we need to capture all of that traffic and do it with pretty high fidelity because if we miss a packet um, in that copy of the traffic, that could mean missing part of a handshake and that means missing the steganographic tag, uh, which affects both the, you know, the throughput, the ability to connect and the user experience for the clients trying to connect. So uh, it's pretty important that we're able to handle all of that traffic um, in real time without losing really any of those packets. And so the way we do that is by leveraging PFRing zero copy. Uh, and that's what we place at the ingest layer to allow us to map packets from the network card into user space so that we can do that flow tracking and tag checking and identify those participating connections uh, as efficiently as possible. And so in our current deployment, um, PFRing zero copy helps us to handle all of that traffic and does it uh, with a minimal drop rate uh, as we go. So our current deployment uh, as of right now is seven stations deployed across three independent research networks. And in total, we're monitoring around 250 gigabits per second. Um, and this is probably going to see a pretty significant expansion uh, to new networks and new locations in the future, but we are always looking for new partners um, new internet service providers, new challenges, new ways to deploy the software. Um, this is our ongoing deployment of the TapDance and Conjure protocol. I walked through the TapDance protocol a bit earlier, and uh, Conjure is sort of an updated version of that that's, that's easier to run, uh, more difficult to block, a little more modular, um, and gives us some more flexibility in the ways that we uh, distribute client software. So to take a look at the effect that TapDance and Conjure have had, um, we can look at some of the usage statistics, and this is uh, bytes transferred on client behalf. Uh, TapDance is in green and Conjure is in yellow. This is aggregate across uh, the entire deployment. Um, we deploy currently to around uh, two and a half million client devices globally. Um, and you can see here that uh, typically both protocols average somewhere around a terabyte of client traffic a day. Uh, and Conjure, which came online in early 2021, uh, does a bit better as it's an updated protocol and uh, has seen a pretty significant uh, use in the last year. So just to cover some, some, some of the impact that this deployment has had, uh, this is a, a, a quick look at some of the uh, network traffic at, in, uh, in Cuba that we saw last summer. Uh, maybe you'll remember that uh, around uh, mid-July, Cuba had several protests relating to uh, food and medicine shortages uh, based on COVID-19 restrictions and resource management. Um, so over the course of about a week, there was pretty significant protesting and then government uh, regulation, especially of internet connections. And that started in the form of you know, social media restrictions and then uh, trying to block access to proxies and circumvention tools. And so this is sort of the environment where refraction networking shines. And this gives a good example of when it's important that tools like Conjure and TapDance and Refraction Network in general are available. Um, as the more direct and traditional proxies were being blocked, 
uh, Conjure saw a big increase in the number of users and it was able to keep a large number of those, those users connected to the internet, allowing them to you know, organize and communicate and um, stay connected online. Um, another quick uh, deep dive uh, is our deployment in China where Conjure came online. We, we enabled Conjure in China uh, in uh, fall of last year. And while the refraction networking protocols are very good and typically very difficult to block, we are still seeing that occasionally it looks like there are some blocking-like behaviors um, happening in December of last year and around March, April. Um, we're still sort of looking into those. So the protocol and development are ongoing. Uh, the deployment is ongoing as well and trying to grow every day with new partners and new clients. Um, and with that, I would like to just say a quick thank you to the uh, PFRing and NTOP teams for supporting us with uh, research licenses and with um, bug fixes and responsive answers when, we're, when we need uh, some help. So thank you. Uh, beyond that, I would like to say a thank you to our partners at Siphon, the Merit Research Network, University of Colorado, University of Michigan, and uh, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, thanks.